It was December 24th, 2013, and my partner and I were traveling from New Mexico, where we were new high school teachers, to Columbus, Ohio, home, hopefully in time to make it to my grandmother's annual Christmas Eve party. Unfortunately, we didn't make it. But before I explain to you why we didn't make it, I want to back up and give you two important points of background. First, concerning my appearance. Like I said, I was a new high school teacher, and so exhaustion was something that you could read on my body. My hair was longer and even more unkempt than it is today. My beard, if you'll believe it, was also longer and even more unkempt today. And what I want to tell you is that these factors of my embodiment commingled with some more permanent ones, like my long, curved, aquiline nose, to render me in the minds of the passengers, and one passenger in particular, a terrorist threat. Two, I want to talk to you about my cat, Auden. Auden is a black and white tuxedo cat. He has these beautiful green, emerald green eyes, and I was traveling with him for the first time. Like any responsible parent, I had gone to the Frontier website and I had determined the precise specifications for cat carriers, so I didn't think that it would be a problem. And it wasn't. I got on the airplane, I put the cat carrier under the seat in front of me, and it fit, save for maybe an inch, an inch and a half that was sticking out. Unfortunately, the woman sitting next to me didn't agree. She called over the flight attendant. We had a little bit of a fight about the cat carrier, wherein I was more caustic than I care to admit today, and I was unfortunately kicked off the plane and didn't make it home in time for my grandmother's annual Christmas Eve party. I'm telling you this story for two reasons. The first reason, and the most important reason, and the reason why I put all of this work into speaking today, is to tell an audience so big Never fly frontier. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All of the airlines are racist. Right? <laughs> no, the real reason why I've come to speak to you today is that I want to explain how some of my research in a, uh, a field, an emerging field called posthumanism, helped me make sense of that interaction I had in December 2013. And so I need to begin with some definitions. Posthumanism, and I want to say, it's a big, unwieldy theory. There are folks who are using it in a lot of different ways, ways that maybe I'm not taking up today. But I want to focus on these two central characteristics. First, posthumanism insists that human identity or embodiment is always in flux, always changing, always situated in a very specific material and cultural context. So, for example, in December 2013, my physical characteristics like my beard, my hair, my nose, I want to say that those were being read alongside the airplane that I was flying on or hoped to fly on. The cat carrier that I had tucked under the seat in front of me, which presumably may have been a bomb, um, and as well as the ways that these objects interact with dominant cultural ideas about race, terrorism, and national security. On that airplane, cat carrier in front of me, I wasn't a teacher like I maybe am when I'm standing in front of a chalkboard with a group full of students. Instead, my embodiment came to include both my material and cultural surroundings, rendering me a terrorist threat, a person about whom Frontier would rather be safe than sorry. Second, Posthumanism challenges traditional humanist notions of identity and embodiment, demonstrating how static or fixed theories of what it means to be human, where our human identity is kind of based within our bodies inherently and naturally, arguing that this way of thinking has historically harmed precarious populations like folks of color, queer and disabled folks and women by framing them as less than human in a lot of really shitty ways. So if we're going to talk about post-humanism then, we need to start by examining humanism. And what better way than to look at da Vinci's iconic Vitruvian Man, which I would assert is maybe one of the most popular images associated with humanist thinking. And I want to just briefly make some observations. I note that Vitruvius, he was supposed to be perfectly proportional, perfectly ideal, ideally shaped. And we can see da Vinci gesturing that at that idea here. Vitruvius is very tall, he seems very strong, he stands upright. Um, and I also want to note that he's a white person, and I also want to note that he's a white male. 
Finally, I want to note that he's standing in the center of both a square and a circle with his arms stretched out, touching arms and legs stretched out, touching both. I remember from my ninth grade humanities class that this was supposed to symbolize the way that man, and I mean very literally man, and a specific kind of man, is said to stand in humanist thinking at the center of both the physical universe, symbolized by the square, as well as the infinite spiritual universe, symbolized by the circle. And importantly, man is the center of these, and he exerts his agency upon them. Rather than the universe acting upon man, man acts upon the universe. That's humanism. The problem with this way of thinking is that it essentializes or naturalizes what it means to be human and thereby neglects the historical cultural factors like racism or sexism, as well as the material factors like cat carriers that are sometimes in some specific spaces used to render some humans more human than others, if you'll let me spin Orwell's famous phrase. For example, it was through an appeal to humanism that white slave owners justified the institution of slavery, arguing in favor of an essential biological difference separating white people from black people, a difference that articulated which humans, quote unquote, get to be masters in which subhumans have to be slaves. After all, it was through an appeal to humanism that Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, writing for the Supreme Court, defended the state practice of forcibly sterilizing mentally disabled folks, writing that these, quote, defectives were a threat to public health, the national body, and that, quote, three generations of imbeciles is enough. The problem with this conception of humanism is that it naturalizes or essentializes what it means to be humans and then doles out rights accordingly. Unfortunately, if history is any kind of reliable guide, those rights have been historically reserved for white, able-bodied, able-minded men marching to the beats of their own drummers. What would a post-humanist ethic look like? What would a post-humanist way of doing analysis look like? To answer this question, I want to look at one more case study, the interaction between George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin on the night when George Zimmerman followed the unarmed 17-year-old black male, called the police to report what he thought was suspicious mere minutes before deciding to execute Trayvon himself. I want to look at the first thing Zimmerman said to the Stanford Police Department when he made that phone call, and I have depicted it on this slide. Hey, and I'm reading from the slide. We've had some break-ins in my neighborhood, and there's a real suspicious guy. It's Retreat View Circle. The best address I can give you is 111 Retreat View Circle. This guy looks like he's up to no good, or he's on drugs or something. It's raining, and he's just walking around, looking around. The first time I read this quote, there was a lot that I was familiar with. And I'll tell you, folks of color are familiar with a lot of these rhetorical maneuvers. The mention of the break-ins, the mention of a real suspicious guy, the mention of the drugs, or it looks like he's up to no good. None of this is new. This is standard issue racism, and it has been around as long as white folk. However, this last line is interesting to me. He says, it's raining, and he's just walking around, looking around. When I first engaged this quote, I wondered, what does the rain have anything to do with this situation? If Zimmerman is gearing up rhetorically to justify murdering an unarmed black male, why does he, need to mention, why does he mention the rain? What's the point in mentioning the rain? What's its rhetorical function? And it was only after I engaged with post-humanist theory that I was able to offer the following provisional answer. That what Zimmerman was attempting to do is to say, I have no problem with young black male mobility. My problem is when a young black male is walking through the rain, because why else, so the logic goes, would a young black male walk through the rain unless he's up to no good? I tell my students this all the time, and I'll say it again. If we are to articulate anti-racist ways of thinking, if we're going to fight these racists, then we have to be honest and acknowledge the creativity of racism, the way that racists are able to take 
beautiful and seemingly non-racist stuff like cats or cat carriers or rain and bring them into their violent ways of thinking, bring them into their regimes of violence and to mobilize them against communities of color. I want to end by asking just a few questions. What would it mean for our various disciplines if we were to incorporate a posthumanist perspective? What would a posthumanist psychology look like? What would a posthumanist history look like? What about a posthuman criminal justice or public policy making? What about a posthuman STEM field like chemistry or mathematics? How cool might that be? And finally, I want to ask about TED. What is TED? saying about the nature of knowledge when it sends out a call for, quote, your unique idea, as if ideas are these things that live in and come out of our individual brains magically, rather than being formed through decades and, in some instances, centuries of complex social and material interactions, the classes we've taken, the people we've known the histories that we've endured, the stories we tell ourselves to endure those histories, the cats and the cat carriers we carry. What's Ted saying about the nature of knowledge when it insists that I stand on this stage alone, like Vitruvius, my arms stretched out, never to leave this circle of light and pitch my idea to you like I'm on an episode of Shark Tank, all while they charge you 15 or 20 bucks a ticket. I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to step outside of this circle. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and end this way. I don't have the answers to any of these questions, but I would love to keep asking them with you. Thank you.